ago, when I walked into my first K-12 classroom, I walked in with a set of books, new boxes of crayons, and teachers, you know, new boxes of crayons, that smell of possibility, and sharpened pencils. There's nothing more comforting than a cup of freshly, newly sharpened pencils ready to be chiseled down into beautiful work. Well, the first few years were rough, as they are for any teacher, regardless of the level. But I learned a few things right away. First, my way of doing school did not fit into the framework of how my students perceived doing school. Second, my initial want of students being excited about everything I could teach them was not a reality. It was a cold reality indeed. And third, my students needed more from me than I had been prepared to give at the time. In essence, instead of ruling my classroom like a queen, I needed to tend it like a garden. I wish I could say that these lessons are different in my online classroom, but they're not. Daily, I am renegotiating relationships with students based on our different frameworks of school, our backgrounds with teachers and education, as well as the demands on their time. I love what I do, and I bet you do too. There are mornings when I hop into my online classroom with my warm cup of coffee in hand, and I'm so excited to see all of the connections my students are making. And then there are days when I hop into my classroom and I nearly spit out my coffee because of the connections that are not being made. And although I had to learn to view my classroom as objectively as possible in teaching K-12, I had to learn to do the same thing in my online Ashford classroom. How I did school while I was at the university is very different from how my students are doing school at Ashford. And I needed to make sure that my biases were in check based on all of our backgrounds, current situations, and life in general. And here is where I started. There's this fantastic study I recommend to everyone in teaching, and it does not matter the age or grade or content that you teach. This article encourages us to make the familiar strange. And what does this mean? Well, this 2003 article by Dr. Ch Julie Keomea from the University of Hawaii tells us of her journey to separate herself from what she was too close to in order for her to objectively observe what she needed to study without being biased from being too close to the problem. She had to derive a way of making the familiar strange in order to be able to look at her own practice in a way that could reflect objectivity onto her teaching and research. She also included information that she drew from, from Victor Schlapskis. And if I am mispronouncing that, I am sorry. <laughs> but she used some of Victor Schlapskis' 1917 and 1965 works that explained that what we do see and hear every day becomes automatic. And in this automaticity, we do not necessarily look at everything objectively. And we move through our days, and dare say our classes, with a to-do list to accomplish. We are challenged to slow ourselves down, to linger, to notice. Those end of course surveys we get at the end of our courses, how much attention do we pay to those? Do we linger over them? Do we dismiss them? Do we notice anything about them? The questions our students send us in the Ask Your Instructor feature of our course. What do we notice from them? Do we linger over them? Or do we answer and then dismiss them? The ideas I present to you today come through a process of defamiliarizing inquiry about my own teaching practice. I want to look beyond what is familiar with my class, my students, my program and surveys. What can I notice and what can I linger over? What can I make more objective in order to help my students succeed? How was I going to help my students bloom where they were planted and not just where I wanted them, wanted them to grow? So as a way to keep us all engaged, because I know it's easy to, oh, let me see what else is going on. I want to know what are some ways you linger in your course? What are some ways that you try to make the familiar strange in your courses? 
And if you could just put it into the chat, I would like to know some of the things you do to linger in your course, to make the familiar strange. I'm seeing crickets. Oh, since I teach law-based courses, I play devil. Ooh, you play devil. Oh, I like that. So to push thinking and to um, make people go to a higher level of critical thinking, I like that. I like to have announcements where students are asking to respond. Oh, I like that as well. Create more reality in my discussions. Oh, Steve, that's interesting. I'm not, maybe you could explain a little more about that. Lynette always reads the course surveys and try to implement those. Yep, linger in discussions throughout curveballs. Try to see the opposite of the picture, asking questions, being devil's advocate. So it looks like we're all doing great things with lingering. I find lingering happens when I offer a thought that takes a new twist on conventional. Ooh, I like that too. Voluntary open discussions, nonfiction books. Absolutely. I love all of those ideas, and I'm probably going to write them down when I watch the recording <laughs> for all of those ideas to see um, what I can implement as those as well. Copying and pasting a small part of the student's discussion. I like that idea. So when I'm thinking of the dominant, narr dominant narrative in my life, and that narrative has changed from when I was younger to now and about how I view education. My narrative includes education is important. That importance is based on individual beliefs. The motivations for education are based on life situations. And if a student is motivated to succeed in education, I want to help. This narrative that I hold is what my children are growing up in. But I'm willing to bet that this narrative differs from many of my students. So this handsome young man you're seeing on your screen is my oldest son, Kirk. And I'm going to use him as an example today. Isn't he handsome? He is a junior at the University of Wisconsin. And while preparing for this presentation, he was struggling. Thank you. I think he's handsome. He was struggling with understanding the ideological underpinnings of horror movies in the 1930s. And he needed scholarly resources to support and disseminate his analysis. He texted me a copy of his assignment and said, what does this even mean? I do not understand ideology. And how can a movie industry have an ideology? These are fantastic questions, right? So when I look at this objectively, my son has a resource in me that many of our students may not have. My son can text or call me with questions and ideas for keywords to help him search in the library. My son can call or text me to talk to me about an article and ask for help searching. By the way, Ashford Library does have scholarly sources, does have scholarly sources about the ideolo ideology of horror movies in the 1930s, if you wanted to look that up. But because I can be objective in my observations of the situation, I have an idea of the gaps that might be in my students' lives and how those gaps might marginalize their education. I want, it, the, being marginalized might keep them too much in that shady part of the garden instead of putting them right in the center of the sunshine in that direct sunlight where they need success, where they can find success. Dr. Kamayo's research helped me put aside some of my preconceived notions about how school had been done or how I had been doing things in order to understand what I can do that will reflect current practice and avoid unanticipated or counterproductive teaching and learning messages, measures. So bringing in this philosophy of making the familiar strange into my K-12 and college classrooms has helped me develop and progress in that daily decision-making that impacts my teaching. So is what I'm doing reinforcing a practice that's not useful or is, it re or is it just not useful for that student? And then what can I do to make sure that student understands? So it's coming back to these questions about assessment that we use all the time. How will I know they know it? And what will I do if I see that they do not know it? 
So in my classroom, I offer many supports through supplemental videos. I look for themes of where my students are struggling. And I do this from lingering over the questions and gaps in learning that are presented through assignment submissions. Through lingering and noticing and making the familiar strange, I go beyond telling my students, go back and read these pages in the book to create video tutorials about topics. For example, in the Bachelors of English Language Learner Studies program, students are required to understand, use, and evaluate language proficiency levels. Now, unless they have a background in this, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to be able to do this. And I recognize this and understand it from working with non-ESL teachers in classrooms where they had ESL students. The content is familiar to me, and I can use this material fluently, but my students may have no background in this, and they're going to need some more support. So I lingered on this question of what will they need in order to understand the information. I also lingered on the question, how can I help them understand the application of this material? From lingering and making my course strange to me, I decided that my students needed a pre-lesson or some pre-teaching video about the topic in the weekly announcements. And then they would need to see the application after reading the information. So I created another video explaining how I teach by demonstrating actual lessons that I have taught and using student examples that I have collected over the many years of teaching. This lingering, the making familiar strange, has helped my students more fully understand a concept that was foreign to them. But how do I know it actually helped? I created the lesson, I had study sessions through office hours, I graded their papers, but how do I know the videos even helped? To continue to make my practice of teaching strange to me, I take extra steps to survey my students about the teaching of the course, the resources and the extra assistance I provide. Because I am providing them the material that I already know, the assumption that I'm making is that this is helpful because I'm giving it. But to truly make the familiar strange, I needed the perspective of those who were the recipients of the tools I provided. So I need to engage in mahiki, which as Dr. Keomeo would say, is the peeling back of my practice. So I send surveys to my students outside of the end of course survey. I use Qualtrics, which is a paid program, but you can use programs such as SurveyMonkey or Google Forms. And I survey my students about the different videos and techniques I used. And this is for my own iterative practice. I do not disseminate this information. It is only for me because I want to be able to look at my course through the lens of a student. And the questions are very simple. Here's a sample. Dr. Jen posts several announcements during the course. Are they helpful? So I'm posting all of these announcements, but am I, what I'm posting isn't even helpful. I need to know this so that I can recreate my announcements. I post many videos. Are they helpful? I don't want my students spending a lot of time on stuff that is just not helpful to them. And then what teaching techniques or activities did I use to help them succeed in the course? So I want to know specifically, what am I doing that is helping? And if it's not helping, help me get it right. That way I can use it in my next classes. And the responses I get are very helpful. I'm only giving you a few here. And of course, I'm going to pick the glowing ones. <laughs> so the first one was, um, I loved how she used videos to supplement the course. It gave her it gave a personal feeling that our instructor was right there to help and the video conferences are a great idea. So the greatest part about this first one is this student was in the United Arab Emirates and I was able to bridge that digital divide with her through creating these videos and making myself an intrusive presence in her course even though we're online and we, we would not see each other, one, because we're on two continents, but I was able to help bridge that and make make it comfortable, provide some of that um, feeling that I can give to Kirk. 
The videos supplement the course information because it expands on what is in the textbook. The textbook tells you about a technique, but the videos dive into the topic more. And then the links. So the videos I create and the resources I create, I make sure that they are an open link so that students can come back, or a static link, so that students can come back and use those in the future. The videos in the study guide are the most effective because I some, sometimes do not understand the text. So in one of my courses, there's quite a bit of brand new vocabulary. And if you're in literacy teaching or in English, we call these tier two and tier three vocabulary, very domain specific. So I created lessons around the vocabulary. And if you've seen the, um, the videos that Sir Ken Robinson puts out about when he does the drawings and connects all of these concepts and ideas, they're, they're in that genre, they're not that, well produced, but it gives my, it gives my students an idea and pre-teaches them the vocabulary so that they are able to use that as they're reading instead of being stumped on the vocabulary. Um, I encourage them to take notes and then the videos made me feel as if I was getting all I needed because I was a visual learner. So the idea behind this is to, um, bridge that divide and to give students some of the help I can give my son and some of that feeling of I'm here to help. So now I want you to think of your own classroom. And we talked about earlier how you make the familiar strange. Now I want you to think about, yeah, we talked about how, how we linger in our class. Now I want you to think about how, how do you make the familiar strange? How can you use the idea of making the familiar strange to help your students? So I'm curious your ideas now. What are some ideas that you have to make the familiar strange to help your students. Patricia um, says that she wants to include videos in her classroom because students are having trouble with technical aspects. Patricia, I do that too, especially for my students. Um, I'm fortunate to be able to use the conferences app or the conferences feature in Canvas right now. And I did um, a very short minute and a half video for my students about how to access conferences and then how to access the digital textbook. And they really do appreciate that. And so when you have those already recorded, and I use a program called Screencast-O-Matic, and I pay for it so I can keep the videos there. Um, as my students are having difficulty, I can put those links right into their feedback in their homework or in their assignments and their discussion and their journals, wherever they're needing that feedback at the moment. Contrasting ideas with current events, absolutely. And so when you work in a field where you're working with many immigrants, which is as an ESL teacher, and English as a second language teacher, there are many preconceived notions. So some of what we do in that class is talking about how are we shifting our own perspective about how we view students who come from other countries. where students can post end of week announcements. Absolutely, another thing I do with those videos is I don't know how many of you are using the video feature in the discussion. Um, I'm getting incredible feedback about that and my students really enjoy, they post their original post and then I post a question and then all of the feedback, I encourage them to use video because that helped, helps. And I, I use quite a bit of video in the feedback as well so that, um, so that they can hear my tone and know that I'm here as a helping person, not as somebody who um, is the omniscient one. Oh, blogging and linked with the course. I know um, if you know Dr. Tisha Shipley in ECE, she does quite a few blogs as well. Um, McDonald's coffee case. Oh, I like that. Changing the company's behavior. Hi, Yulia. Teaching ELL specifically about their state, absolutely. Providing resources. Use screencast, screencast to model concepts, exactly. Create memes, that's an excellent idea. I might steal that and use it in a class. So if you see it, it's beg borrowing and stealing and teaching here. Oh, absolutely. Um, if you want information about this, 
send me an email. It's jennifer.robinson at ashford.edu. I am so happy. I will set up a Zoom and talk to you and show you how I do it. Um, I can even provide links for you that I use. I'm more than happy to help with this. And sharing memes would be hysterical. I would love to do that. <laughs> So when I do send out this survey, some of the results I get, um, I do use them. This is the most negative one I've, I have received so far, um, that some of the videos were too long. And they're right. As you can clearly see, I'm someone who likes to talk. So when I get going on a topic, I will get going on that topic. So this is something I have learned to, um, I'm working to rectify. So I now tell my students how long the video is and then if there's something within that video i want them to focus on i will tell them for example i have one video about academic writing i have students who who struggle quite a bit with academic writing so i will use the first discussion prompt as the model for how to do this thing we call academic writing but if i see you know week two week three they're still struggling i'll say hey i want you to fast forward to minute 445 in that video and I, I want you to watch that again, and I want you to let me know what questions you have. When can we meet and talk about it? So it really is helpful to have these so that I can send out um, reminders or just in case you didn't get that on the first time, because we know in a face-to-face -face classroom, we can say these things multiple times over and over for clarification, but in a digital classroom, in an online classroom, we have to be more intrusive with how we're doing that. And some students may not want to ask us. so. Coming full circle from Kirk, who has all of this access and help with understanding material and students, um, some of our students just may not know where to go or who to ask. Kirk could very easily go ask his, his professor, but he's uncomfortable doing that sometimes. Um, and I want my students to feel that same level of comfort coming to me to ask questions as Kirk does. Granted, it yes, it's a different relationship, but I still want to cultivate that relationship with my students. So my son has resources that many of my students may not have. That is what's familiar to me. So to make this strange, I am going to be a resource to my students and I'm going to do the best I can to bridge that divide with them so that they feel a level of comfort in coming to me instead of some a feeling that is negative. My son can call or text me with questions and ideas for keywords to search and, and for, with the library. And you know what? To make that strange for my students, I have a very similar policy. When I taught in face-to-face -face classrooms, I had an open door policy. If I'm around, come in. And I have the same for my online classrooms. And sometimes a student will send me a text at night and say, are you online? I need help. If I can't, I just say no. But I go pretty late. I have an open door policy because I want to bridge that divide. I tell them that when I do my office hours, this is what it is for. It is an open door for us to have a conversation um, or exchange recipes, whatever they feel like doing that night. Next, my son can call or text me um, about an article and ask for help searching. And I do not want my students to feel like by asking me a question, they're somehow framing themselves as not intelligent. I just asked a question of one of my deans this morning that I felt embarrassed about, but that's why we're here. Because, and I want them to know that that's why we're here. We're here and we want to have that level of comfort with them. So making the material in my course strange to me allows me to find gaps in knowledge and situations that, that could stump my students. So now I want you to contemplate in your own course, how will you make the familiar strange? How will you leap over the digital divide to help your students successfully grow as a student? And how will you engage in mehiki to better your practice? <laughs>